Hello, welcome to Nature Source Care. My name is Dr. Fonda Goldman and I'm a licensed naturopathic physician with a private practice in Stratford, Connecticut. Today I'd like to talk to you about increasing the earth element in foods. So foods that increase a sense of heaviness and inertia both in the body and the mind. And this is a concept, uh, Ayurvedic concept, uh, the concept of kapha. So a note of caution before we get too deep into this is that the information presented here is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. And for individual medical advice or if symptoms are worse or uh, worsening or severe, please seek a qualified healthcare professional. So first off, what is Ayurveda? I use that term, but what is it? So Ayurveda is also known as traditional Indian medicine. It's a tradition that's actually over 5,000 years old. And what I think is special about Ayurveda is that it has a very deep knowledge about food and how it affects both the body and the mind. And not just food particles or food chemistry, but whole food. Um, in this paradigm also, there includes this idea of energetics of food. So some foods are heating, for example, whereas other foods are cooling. So if you take a look at the pictures here, we have a little bit of yogurt um, and we have a uh, ginger root and we have a few leaves of mint. So of these, which is gonna be the hottest? Uh, so obviously it's gonna be the ginger, it's gonna be the hottest. Now, which is the coolest? Actually, yogurt and mint are both cooling, but mint is dry, uh, light and cool, and yogurt is heavy and cool. So those are actually, uh, they have different energetics, even though they're both cool. Um, as I mentioned uh, very briefly is that, again, Ayurveda really has this deep tradition of understanding how whole food um, affects the body, not just food chemistry. And what I mean by that is what you put on your plate for breakfast, lunch, dinner, how does that affect your body? Not just like if you take some, uh, some ginger root and you process it in a, in a chemical laboratory and then decide that there are this many essential oils and this and that. Um, you kind of, in some ways, lose sight of what, again, the whole food is doing for you um, because that's what we have to choose from in the grocery store. The other thing about Ayurveda that's important and distinct is that they talk about not just what to eat, but how and when you eat is just as important. Ayurveda is also, I think, beneficial in that it's a timeless uh, tradition. Um, you know, people have been using this for thousands of years, um, and it's in some ways a direct contrast to modern Western society where one day somebody will write a book or come up with some new theory, and everybody kind of goes crazy about it and jumps on that bandwagon, and then a couple years later somebody else writes a book, and then people are heading in a totally different direction. So that's what's nice about it. It's also a pretty sustainable diet. Um, when I give people Ayurvedic diets, they don't tend to have a problem on them. Um, they may on occasion miss uh, one or two foods, but they can't do it, and it doesn't interfere with their life, um, you know, their physical life, their social life. Um, it's a pretty doable diet, uh, besides the fact that people see results. And I already talked about in these, uh, these within this group of photos here, which is the hottest and which is the coldest. Um, even though mint and yogurt are both cold, actually because of the opaqueness and the heaviness of yogurt, that would be considered even colder than the mint, although mint is also cold. So what is kapha? Um, within this framework of Ayurveda, within this paradigm of Ayurveda, people um, and symptoms both are considered from an elemental point of view. Um, I've made two other videos. Uh, one was on the fire element or pitta, and one was on the wind element, vata. So this one is the earth element or kapha. So what are the qualities of kapha or earth? Um, they would be considered heavy, cold, wet, cloudy, immovable, and smooth. Uh, and some people, everybody has some kapha in their system, but some people naturally have more kapha than others. They would be considered to have a kapha, kapha constitution. Um, and there are different situations in which you can actually increase kapha in the body and you become more kapha-like. Um, 
So you can kind of think of the difference between a glacier and a garden, right? A glacier is smooth, it's frozen, it's heavy, you know, it's like we even talk about things being glacially slow, <laughs> right? Versus a garden. Um, a garden is also very cophagenic um, or kapha like in that it's very uh, moist and rich and dense, right? You have to have this good, nutritious soil to have seeds grow and develop. So what we're trying to do with um, folks uh, who have too much kapha is move from having too much kapha where, again, things aren't moving, things are seen kind of frozen, things are kind of um, growing but not in the best ways to becoming more of a garden. So kapha that's best. Again, not all things are bad if they're uh, kapha-like. Um, a kapha gives the body and the mind stability, um, and it makes people grounded, it makes them steady, it makes them consistent, it makes them reliable. Not just within their body, their bodies don't tend to change very easily. This is almost in direct contrast to someone who's very vatagenic or um, windy. Uh, people who are windy, you know, their weight can go up and down, you know, um, turns on a dime. Like you see actually a lot of um, actresses and actors you know, their weight fluctuates quite a bit. That's actually kind of a vata quality because their bodies are changing so much. Kapha people, they don't tend to change. Um, so the good part of that is that, again, they're grounded, they're steady, they're consistent, reliable. Um, kapha also tends to be um, a very sweet, it's a sweet taste, but it's also a sweet disposition. People who are kaphagenic, because they're so steady, um, they don't have a lot of internal kind of angst or anxiety the way a vata person does they're not trying to you know <laughs> rule the world and take over the world the way a pitta person does with all that fire you know they're just very calm and steady internally and because of that they're pretty cheerful and pretty peaceful and pretty calm um also because they're so steady they tend to be really great support people and they tend to be very compassionate helpful and kind so you can imagine somebody who's um i you know sort of the ideal kapha person is like extremely good at customer service where they can kind of field calls or um, inquiries from customers all day, people who are upset or you know disappointed. Um, and that that's the kind of person who could just say, oh, sure, I'd be happy to help in a very genuine, <laughs> a warm way and does help and then puts this person who is on edge, you know, and turns their whole energy around um, so that they're a happy customer again. That's kind of the ideal kapha state or quality. So kapha in excess. Um, so when there's too much earth or kapha element, what we see is heaviness and inertia uh, of all kinds in the body and the mind. So examples of this physically could be like pale skin. Um, they tend to be, um, even if somebody is a person of color, you can see that the pallor, like there's not this sort of heat or redness or kind of vitality skin tends to be smooth um, and kind of opaque. Um, it's a quality um, to it versus like vata skin, which tends to be dry or pitta skin, which tends to be oily and red. So just to give you some examples there, um, edema tends to happen. So this is just swelling with water in different parts of the body. It can even be pitting edema. But again, part of the reason why earth is steady is because there's just a good amount of water mixed up with the dirt itself. Uh, lipomas or tumors can form in the body because again the tissue is growing it creates mass stones of all kinds gallbladder stones kidney stones these can also form um, and they even call them stones so again uh, there's a relationship there with the earth element or kapha constipation can happen because the colon gets or the digestion gets too cold and too slow so it slows down the whole system um, people with excess kapha also tend to have a hard time getting motivated to do something, especially start something new. Um, and in the medical world, this can often translate into exercise. Um, they may not like exercise, um, or they have a hard time kind of getting, getting into a regular rhythm with it, you know. Um, you know, whereas vata people tend to exercise almost too much or they're always moving. 
Um, they never settle down. And fit to people can be very goal oriented. So um, because they have different like maybe body goals or something like that, they're um, motivated to work out. Um, Kapha people can also end up with arthritis, but spe specifically the kind of arthritis where the joints are swollen, not necessarily where they're hot or red or painful. Um, hot, red, painful joints um, would potentially be a sign of pitta. A kind of creaking, cracking joints um, can be a sign of uh, bata type of arthritis. So when the blood, um, when the person develops diabetes, that means that the sugar is too high in their blood, so their blood gets heavy with sugar. When somebody has high cholesterol, they have um, too much cholesterol in their blood, so their blood gets heavy with cholesterol. If somebody um, with excess kapha has pain, it's the kind of pain that's dull and constant. So it's not a sharp pain like pitta might have, and it's not a come and go intermittent type pain like vata might have. Uh, people with more kapha, they can have a late period, so their cycle may run more like 35, even 40 days long instead of the sort of textbook 28 days. Um, and they can tend towards uh, fatigue and bloating, specifically water retention, um, you know, with their period. Because again, the fatigue, inertia, and the bloating, water retention, right? It's going to make them heavy and, and feel make their body feel dull. Uh, Kapha people have the most... Uh, trouble with being overweight because again their body just naturally likes to build mass um, their memory also kind of functions this way so they may not be the quickest um, person to pick up new information but what they do pick up they'll remember for a very long time so again there's that kind of slowness in acquisition but there's that um, kind of steadiness in terms of um, uh, containment, right, over the long haul. Kava people tend to have the most um, likelihood of developing depression because the mind gets too heavy. Um, there's just not enough kind of stimulation or lightness or um, redirection. Um, and actually, we're going into close to a year right now of lockdowns all over the world because of the COVID um, coronavirus infection pandemic uh, that's been going on for about a year now and a lot of people are getting depressed um, not just because they can't work in the usual ways or socialize in the usual ways but they're stuck at home and there's not a whole lot to do so a lot of the opportunities to move have disappeared and a lot of opportunities to get new kinds of stimulation have disappeared um, and so, actually, a lot of this depression is, uh, in Ayurvedic terms, uh, attributed to people developing too much kapha in the mind and in the body. Um, yeah, so there's one, you know, modern example. Um, people with too much kapha also can develop um, pretty strong levels of greed and attachment. Because, again, kapha is heavy and sticky. Um, and it doesn't really move. So um, Kapha people don't like uh, change. They like to um, build and acquire, and they don't really like to let go. Um, so it's going to be a problem if the Kapha is too high. So what increases Kapha? Well, obviously we're going to talk about food today, so we'll get into that. But also weather. So cold, cloudy, wet weather um, can increase Kapha. So you can think of like maybe Seattle or... Um, you know, cold, wet places, not necessarily cold, dry places, but cold, especially cold, um, wet places like Seattle. I mean, they're kind of known for having a lot of rain and cloudy days. And maybe that's why Starbucks got started there, the famous coffee company, because <clears throat> all that caffeine, you know, kind of jolts the system and to some degree, uh, balances that sort of natural inertia that tends to happen when people are in that kind of weather for long periods of time. Um, activities, or more more so lack of activities, again, the more that somebody sits, the more that um, they will potentially develop excess kapha. Now, that's not to say people shouldn't rest and be relaxed, but, you know, there's a fine line between that and then really developing sort of inertia or, you know, apathy. Um, and we already talked about the lack of movement stimulation. So to decrease kapha, what you want to think about 
um, in terms of your food because you want to increase the opposite qualities to balance out that kapha. So if kapha is heavy and dense and uh, wet, what you want um, is light, dry, warm food. So if we talk about the taste uh, just for a minute here, um, you can to some degree determine how much kapha is in a food by its taste. So some tastes, um, so at least in Ayurveda, tastes are actually broken down into elements as well. So if we look at here like um, pungent, so spicy taste. Spicy taste is made up of air and fire. Air and fire actually would balance out this uh, kapha, heavy, dense kapha energy. Um, so pungent spicy foods um, are foods that would decrease kapha. Likewise, astringent and bitter foods, astringent is made up of earth and air, bitter foods are made of air and ether. So astringent foods like pomegranate um, would help to balance out kapha, and bitter foods like green leafy vegetables, right, really light, um, airy stuff, probably the airiest kinds of foods you can eat, those types of foods tend to balance the kind of heaviness and wetness of kapha. Foods that increase kapha, so you tend to want to decrease these tastes in your diet, is sweet. That's the most obvious one, because sweet is made up of earth and water, and kapha is made of earth and water. Sour taste also um, is made of earth and fire, so that can be a problem if there's too much sour um, taste in the diet. And salty, because salt um, taste is made up of the elements of water and fire, so again, that water element, kapha people tend to hold on to water, and their bodies love to hold on to water, so there you go, the breakdown of taste uh, in the relationship to kapha. So let's go through different food categories. So if we look at fruit, the fruit that you want to avoid are fruits that are juicy and that are heavy, and you want to increase fruits that are light and dry. So there's a small list. So fruits that are juicy and heavy, avocado. I mean, that's a pretty heavy, most people don't even think of it as a fruit because it's a pretty, um, you know, oily fruit, but technically it is a fruit. Bananas, you know, again, those are pretty heavy fruit compared to other things. Coconut uh, is cold and heavy. Dates, figs, you know, again, these are pretty sweet uh, fruits here. A grapefruit, that might be a little bit of a weird one, but actually it's because of the size. So, you know, if you compare the size of grapefruit versus an orange or lime or tangerine, grapefruit has the biggest size. So anything that's going to be big um, by its nature, um, it has a certain amount of kapha within itself. So you don't want that translating into your diet. Kiwi, that's a juicy fruit, so kapha's going to hang on to all that water. Mango, also pretty juicy and sweet, so not the best. Melons, cold, juicy, sweet. Um, those are better for summertime and if you're a vata or a pizza person. Oranges, uh, juicy. Papaya, pretty heavy. Pineapple, juicy, heavy. Plums, rhubarb, tamarind, and watermelon. So you get the gist here. So fruits that are uh, more favorable for kapha. Apples, applesauce, apricots, berries. So you can see these are lighter, drier fruits. Cherries, cranberries, you know. It's hard to eat cranberries without any extra sweetener. They're pretty tart. Um, figs, dry figs versus fresh figs. Why? Because the dryness would actually help balance all that water in the kapha body versus a fresh fig, which are pretty plump and juicy. Um, because when you eat dry fruit, dry food, not just fruit, but what it does, it actually draws water out of the body because your body needs water to process all that food in the digestive system. Um, grapes, light, lemon, uh, peaches, pears, you can see these are all light and dry, persimmons, pomegranates, prunes, raisins, again, more dry fruit, and strawberries. So there you have a list of fruits favorable and not so much for kapha. As far as vegetables, most vegetables are pretty good for kapha because, again, most vegetables are uh, bitter and pungent. But the sweet, juicy ones are the ones you want to avoid. So cucumber, right? I mean, those are pretty juicy, um, especially, um, but they're great for cooling things down. So if you have a lot of pit in the middle of summer, cucumber's a good idea, but not a great idea for kapha. Olives, you know, they're oily, so they're dense. 
they're heavy. Parsnips, again, that's root vegetable, sweet potatoes. They're root vegetable and it's sweet, um, as opposed to, say, like a white or yellow potato. You know, when you cook a white or yellow potato, it's actually pretty dry unless you put something on it. But sweet potatoes retain moisture um, better than a white potato. Um, pumpkin, again, it's a pretty big uh, vegetable. So again, just to some degree by nature of its size, um, it gives you an indication that within that uh, vegetable, there is a certain amount of cough already. Summer squash, like zucchini and that yellow neck squash, um, you know, when you start cooking them, you see all this water. They're very watery vegetables. Taro root, um, tomatoes, watery, zucchini. Um, it's part of the summer squash, actually. So these uh, sweet, juicy vegetables you tend to want to avoid, but you can see there's a whole long list of uh, favorable veggies like artichokes, asparagus, beets, bitter melon, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. So you can see that these are lighter, drier. Burdock root, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, celery, cilantro. Um, you can go through the rest of this list yourself, but um, you can see, you know, just sort of qualitatively the difference in these two lists. So lots of vegetables, uh, good for grains. So a lot of grains. Um, Kafa has to find the right ones because a lot of grains are cooling and they're wet. And these are the ones that tend to be the sort of most prominent, I would say, especially in the Western, modern Western diet. Um, so um, again, you want to avoid the cooling wet ones. So bread with yeast, um, not the best idea. Oats cooked, again, cold uh, grain um, that are wa that's watery, you know, because it soaks up all that water while you cook it. Pancakes, you know, those are loaded with, you know, uh, besides uh, grain, uh, usually milk and oil and eggs. So it's a pretty heavy um, way to take your grains in. Pasta, um, too cold. A rice, especially white and brown rice, not a great idea for kapha. Rice cakes, um, they're dry, but again, the rice just tends to retain water and wheat also tends to retain water. But there are a lot of warming and drier grains that are better for kapha. So amaranth, barley, buckwheat, uh, cereal, cold and dry cereal as opposed to wet, um, you know, cooked mush or something like that. Corn, couscous, crackers, um, durum flour, granola. So you can see like even the cereals here, again, granola dry. Millet is dry and heating. Oat bran, so that's pretty dry. Um, polenta, quinoa, rice, especially basmati and wild rice because they're going to be lighter and drier. Rye. Rye bread, you know, obviously you can you can even see it when you leave it for just a little while. It tends to get dry pretty quickly. Seitan, spelt, sprouted wheat bread, tapioca, and wheat bran. So if you tend towards s stick with the foods um, in the favorable category, um, you'll end up with grains that are more supportive and balancing of kapha instead of, you know, attributing to it. Legumes. Legumes are pretty good uh, for the most part for kapha because most legumes, beans, and lentils are light and dry, so that balances the cold heaviness. Um, within this family food group, though, the ones you want to avoid kidney beans, they're pretty heavy and they're wet. Almost all soy products, so soybeans, soy cheese, soy flour, soy powder, soy sauce, tofu, miso. Um, uh, soy is a very heavy legume. Um, it can actually decrease thyroid function, which again, most uh, kapha people or kapha people have the most tendency to have thyroid issue because they have a slow metabolism. Um, so it can show up that way. Um, so you basically want to avoid soy for the most part. Um, or a dal that's a um, lentil, basically a lentil variety from India. What you could favor instead are azuki beans, black beans, Black eyed peas, chickpeas, again, these are lighter, drier. Lentils, red and brown, lima beans, mung beans, mini beans, dried peas, um, pinto beans. The only kind of soy you might want to do occasionally, and I wouldn't even do this every day, is soy milk, but hot and spiced. Because if you drink cold, um, plain soy milk, it's going to be heavy, dense, and wet, right? So you want the heat and the spice to balance that out a bit. Spit. Split peas, tempeh, okay. Tofu, so again, hot tofu, like maybe in a stir fry, but you don't necessarily want cold tofu. Um, Tour dal, it's another legume from India, and white beans. 
So most, again, beans and lentils, pretty good for kapha. Dairy. Okay, so dairy is a bit problematic uh, for kapha because it's very kapha-like for the most part. Um, it's heavy, it's dense, it's cooling, uh, but not all dairy. So the dairy to avoid butter, you know, it's pretty heavy oil, especially when you compare it to something like sunflower oil. Uh, most cheese is going to be a problem because cheese is dense, it's heavy, it's cold. Cow's milk um, is usually a problem because it's cold and heavy, it's hard to digest, um, as opposed to goat's milk. Goat's milk is heavy, but it's actually heating in nature. That's why uh, some of my patients, like some of my kids uh, who have allergies, you know, they end up creating a lot of phlegm in their body. Sometimes what we do is we get them off the cow's milk and have them go into goat's milk or almond milk. And that cow's milk, like their phlegm, their mucus production really decreases. Um, so it's very helpful for them. Ice cream, cold, heavy, dense, not a good idea. Sour cream, cold, heavy, dense. Yogurt, cold, heavy, dense. So uh, you can see there's a pretty clear pattern here. What you could favor instead is buttermilk, a little bit of ghee, goat's milk, goat's cheese, yogurt, um, better if it's a like skim or uh, decreased fat percentage or diluted. So you can get a little bit of that um, calcium um, without it being too heavy and increasing kapha. But eating a lot of yogurt on a cold, cloudy day is not going to make a kapha person happy. <laughs> So meat and kapha. So in this category, you want to favor the lighter, drier meats. So um, so chicken, and specifically the white part of the chicken, eggs, especially the white part of the eggs. Fish, freshwater fish, um, saltwater fish. Again, that salt is going to increase water retention, and kapha people tend to, have, tend to have a problem with that. Rabbit, or pretty light meat. Shrimp, um, you know, uh, is also a lighter drier uh, version of seafood, um, turkey, especially the white part, the turkey and venison. So I have on here egg whites and shrimp starred because uh, if you have a cholesterol problem, problem, you don't really want to take in that many egg yolks. So you want to do the whites of the eggs and shrimp is actually pretty high in cholesterol. So that may not be an option for somebody with too much uh, cholesterol going on. The meats to avoid, the really kind of uh, heavier stuff, you know, especially they tend to have a lot of the gristle or meat, uh, fat marbleized in between the protein. So lamb, pork, beef, buffalo, chicken, the dark part, and the, the skin of the chicken. Again, that's the fatty, heavy part of the meat. Um, duck, you know, it's a pretty fatty food. Most seafood, again, from the ocean, so salt um, water creatures. And turkey, the dark part of the turkey, and the skin of the turkey. So you can see if you stick with the lighter, drier portions of the meat category, that's much more friendly for kapha people. Nuts and seeds, this is also a thoroughly problematic category for kapha because most nuts are heavy and oily uh, and dense. Um, and so that's not really what kapha needs. They, um, again, do much better with light, drier versions. So the light, drier versions tend to be seeds. So like specifically pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, chia, flax seeds, uh, cheryl nuts. Those are the only nuts really on this list. Um, I haven't actually eaten one, but they are on the list. So if you uh, have one, let me know how that goes. Um, and popcorn, but popcorn without salt because you don't want the salt retaining water and you don't want butter because butter is too heavy. So if you just do plain pop, Popcorn, that would be all right. But to avoid almonds, walnuts, Brazil nuts, cashews, coconut filberts, you know, slash hazelnuts, macadamia nuts, peanuts, pine nuts, pistachios, halva, tahini, sesame, and psyllium. So um, again, most nuts, very heavy, very dense, um, have a lot of oil. Um, that's not gonna be super friendly energetically for kapha people. So oils, so this is another typically sort of problematic category. So you can see like like the vegetables, there was like, you know, almost all good. Um, and then there's some categories that, you know, just kapha really has got to watch. So oils, because again, most oils are heavy, dense, um, nutritionally and calorically. So kapha people want to avoid canola oil, coconut, avocado, olive, peanut, safflower, sesame, soy, walnut. Sounds like almost all of them. 
what they want to favor instead are like corn oil, sunflower oil, and small amounts of ghee. Um, these are going to be the lightest and driest oils, but the nature of oil in and of itself is usually heavy, dense, and, you know, again, fatty. So uh, Kafka's is really going to watch the oils here. Spices. Okay, so this is a good one for Kafa. <laughs> so this is, you know, so it's, again, it seems sort of like all or none with Kafa. So spices, almost all spices are favorable for Kafa. Because again, almost all spices um, are stimulating and they're going to get, you know, kapha moving on some level. The one to avoid, though, um, is salt because of that water retention. And again, kapha people have a hard time with water retention generally. So enjoy your parsley, cinnamon, and basil. Um, you have fun with that. Um, so the food that you do eat can be well spiced. So beverages, this list pretty much corresponds with things we've already talked about. So kapha wants to avoid alcohol, you know, just too much sugar, um, uh, too heavy, too dense. Almond milk is not the best idea. Cherry juice, especially sour, we talked about sour taste. Chocolate milk, so cold, heavy, sweetened milk. Again, that's like, you know, kapha on top of kapha on top of kapha. Cold dairy drinks, so... There you go, kapha on top of kapha on top of kapha. Grapefruit juice, we talked about grapefruits. Um, ice drinks, again, too cold, lemonade, um, you know, too sour, miso, tofu, uh, soy-based, orange juice. Uh, you know, again, it's a pretty um, juicy fruit. Papaya, too heavy. Rice milk, rice uh, retains water. And then sour juice is because of the sour taste. So in favor instead, aloe vera, some... Occasionally diluted, some diluted fruit juice, but again, I wouldn't go too crazy with fruit juice because it tends to be too sweet for most people, but especially kapha. You could do a little bit of diluted apple, apricot berry, sweet cherry, cranberry, mango, peach, pear, pineapple, pomegranate, or prune juice, apple cider on occasion, black tea. Again, black tea is going to be light, dry, astringent. Um, and a little bit of caffeine will get um, kapha moving. Again, nobody wants to exploit caffeine too much, but actually kapha does the best of the three. Um, vata gets too anxious and too speedy with caffeine, and um, pitta people get too driven. You know, they kind of abuse caffeine because they want to do, do, do. Um, and so that kind of puts them in a hyperdrive, and they're already in hyperdrive. Um, so, but black tea actually would be potentially good for kapha. Kara, but sort of a lighter semi version of chocolate. Um, carrot juice, again, carrot juice is going to be lighter and drier than most fruit juice. Chai, as long as it's hot and spiced, you know, we kind of talked about like the hot spiced soy milk, so chai is sort of along the same category, um, so sort of along the same lines. Green coffee. Um, is going to be light and dry, herbal teas, veggie juice, as long as they correspond with the veggie um, slide that we talked about. So it's just sort of integrating what we've talked about so far. Sweeteners. Okay, so you can probably guess sweeteners are going to be tricky for kapha because that sweet taste that right, we talked about in the beginning is made up of earth and water. <clears throat> and earth and water are the essential elements of kapha. So most sweeteners are going to be problematic. Um, the ones to favor fruit juice concentrate. So like if you eat jam, you want a fruit-based jam, not like a sugar-based jam with some a little bit of fruit in it. Honey and agave, because those are going to be the lightest um, sugars. The ones to avoid artificial, white sugar, barley malt, marara, which is on processed sugar, turbinado, coconut sugar, date sugar, maple syrup, and rice syrup. So this category, cough is going to be a little bit more careful with. So just as a parting um, thought here, um, I find that clinically, um, if kapha people again, they don't they don't tend to sort of like change. You know, they they tend to be creatures of habit. So if you can change some of those habits and get them on a different track, then they'll stay on that track. Um, the problem, though, is it moving them from one track to the next. Um, with Vata people, for example, they'll get on track, but then they'll get off track because they'll get distracted, you know, pretty easily <laughs> after a while. And so even if they'll jump on, you know, a new bandwagon, they may not stay on it because, again, they don't 
have this sort of internal consistency. Pitch to people, they they can um, they can kind of overdo it because they can be sort of perfectionists sometimes in their mind, um, but they're goal oriented, so they like to see results, so they can get involved that way. But they also tend to be the most skeptical of the bunch, so sometimes they don't buy into what you're saying if this is all kind of too new for them, or um, I don't know, don't have enough statistics or something like that to back it up. Sometimes they need to see things in black and white. Um, and Pitta people are kind of black and white in their thinking. You know, it's kind of all or nothing. Um, so they either kind of buy in wholeheartedly or they don't buy in at all. But again, the Kapha people, the trouble I see is that they, again, they just have a hard time making changes. So even if they know they're good for them, you know, they'll come in and they'll be like, well, I didn't quite, you know, make the changes or I made a few so it's important to celebrate, you know, and honor every change that's made because it's actually a huge, huge deal for a couple of people. Um, but actually change in general, and I would even say that like movement and exercise and, you know, not just food, but they need to be sort of more active in their lives. Um, that's, that's the main thing. So any, any which way you can get them going is usually um, a positive thing. So anyway, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope this has been helpful. And again, if you um, are interested, I've also made other videos on the other two elements, Vata or Wind and Pitta or Fire. So uh, I wish you well and good health.